Finance and Policy Committee to order. Uh, first of all, if you would all rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And Representative Lissigard, since you've been going over the minutes, would you like to move them? So moved, Mr. Chair. Good. Uh, minutes have been moved. Uh, are there, is there any discussion? Seeing none, uh, all in favor of approving the minutes, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The minutes are mo moved. Um, and now we have uh, Representative Garofalo uh, with House File 837. I'll move that uh, eight, House File 837 be laid over for possible inclusion. And Representative Garofalo, if you'd like to present the bill, identify yourself and present the bill for us, please. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Patrick Garofalo. I'm a state representative from Farmington. Oh. Thank you for allowing me the hearing on this bill. I greatly do. I greatly appreciate it. And also, Mr. Chairman, I want to compliment you on your decision to lead the committee with the Pledge of Allegiance. Um, I think that it's not something I was aware this committee was doing. But I really do like that, and thank you for, um, I don't know if I, I didn't even know you did it, so that's really cool that yeah, you're doing it's that. It's been historical with the Veterans Committee in both chambers, so. So, oh, it's, yeah. it's very nice, thank you. And so, um, Mr. Chairman and members, the bill before you today, House File 837, uh, it strikes a provision that's currently in law that allows, that allows for fees to be charged to those spouses and dependents of those who have served our country. Um, right now, in current law, we do allow the fee to be waived but given the size of our budget surplus and the resources we have available for a very modest amount of money, this would allow us to waive those burial fees again for those spouses and dependents of those who have served our country. Uh, the bill in front, the fiscal note, which I just, I wanna thank staff for getting to me, um, has an annual cost of roughly $316,000 in the first year of the biennium, uh, rising to fiscal year 27, $410,000. Um, I've reviewed the funds that are available in the support our troop fund, uh, support our troop funds, and there is a healthy balance that could easily uh, be absorbed in this. And so, Mr. Chairman, I would ask you and the members of the committee for your support for this bill. And I do have a testifier with me today who's stepping in for someone to um, speak about this. Okay, uh, sir, if you'd please identify yourself for the record and then uh, proceed with your testimony. Chairman Newman, thank you. For, Newton, excuse me. Thank you for letting me testify into the committee. Uh, my name is Jack Schlichting. I live in uh, Cannon Falls. I'm one of three precincts in Goodyear County that Pat, uh, Representative Garofalo is my representative by chance as well. Um, this issue came up to me, actually, I am a spouse of a veteran. My wife served in the Air Force uh, initially with the Tennessee National, well, through the Air Force and training, uh, Tennessee National Guard, and then when we moved to Alaska, she transferred to there. Uh, she did not go through to retirement but she did get honorable discharge, uh, basically family reasons, as a pilot of a C-130. My neighbor, though, who has brought this to my attention, is retired CB and then uh, joined the Minnesota National Guard and was deployed. And I was one of the neighbors that was called on to take care of the spouse in the home during that deployment. And so he made the point to me very clear that the spouse carries as heavy of a burden as the veteran in a deployment and in service. They have to pick up, and you guys are all aware of that, being involved with the, the veteran organizations and, and, and this issue, but they carry a heavy burden as well. And so then upon death, there another, and it's not a significant amount of money, but it's a stress level that they've already gone through while they were a spouse, and now they're being put through stress again at a burial time or their family is. And with the situation financially, it seems like as a state, it's something we could do very easily and in essence uh, kind of be in line with what the federal government's policy is as well. So thank you for uh, letting me share my comments. Good, thank you, Mr. Schlechting. Uh, does anyone have any questions of Representative Garofalo or the, Mr. Schlechting? Uh, seeing none, um, I renew my motion that House File 837 be laid over for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill. And thank you for coming forward. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. We really do appreciate it. Thank you. And is Representative Engen here? He's not here. Yep. Oh, there you are. Uh, please come forward.
I actually brought uh, customary treats as my uh, first bill is being heard, so I'll pass those out here as well. Oh, what a guy. You suppose I got to vote yes on this one? <laughs> <laughs> How good are they? Let's go around the room here. Thank you. Welcome to the uh, committee, Representative Engen. Thank you, Mr. Um, Chair. I move that your House File 904 be re-referred to the House Transportation Policy and Finance Committee. Uh, so if you would, please identify yourself for the record and proceed with your uh, testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Elliot Engen, and I represent District 36A here in the House. This is my first term. And um, ultimately, HF 904, what it does, members, and Mr. Chair, it, it allows applicants to use their disabled American Veterans membership card as a verification of eligibility for specialized license plates. Um, right now, uh, those are actively not uh, confirmed as an eligible. Um, it's, it's not something that is allowed currently, but it also prohibits the DPS from charging people who are eligible for Gold Star specialized license plates, uh, the fee for those, those personal plates. Um, ultimately, this is just clarifying language. It seems like uh, currently, under, under current law, um, the American Legion and the uh, VFW organizations, those membership cards do allow for that fee to be waived, but unintended, unintendedly, the DAV is right now left off. So that's what my bill does. It would just clarify that and um, allow for those, those fees to be waived. Good. Thank you, uh, Representative Ian. You have testifiers? I do. If they would come forward, please. Welcome, Mr. Gary. If you'd identify yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Chairman Newton. I'm Mick Gary, uh, State Commander for the Disabled American Veterans, Department of Minnesota, and I'm the Chairman of the uh, CTF which is the eight recognized service organizations in the state of Minnesota. I'd like to testify in favor of this bill. I'm a combat Vietnam veteran. I can put my hand and rub the names of five people on that wall down here in the Capitol Plaza. I know some of the mom and dads, and they would be more than honored to have this bill pass with the uh, addition of the gold star plates. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Uh, and I, I, it, I think it's a good thing, you know, that we've got the Commander's Task Force behind this as well. So um, do you have any other testifiers, Representative Inga? I don't believe so, no. Okay. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Yes, uh, Re Representative Wilson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I don't have a question. I just kind of wanted to express my, my absolute uh, support for this bill especially the hundred dollar waiving fee so then you know when someone's got a gold star license plate having the ability to specialize that in order to identify to everyone who's driving that this is the person that we're honoring as a result of the sacrifices that they've shown both our nation and our state so i very much appreciate representative ingen bringing this forward and i look forward to seeing it in the transportation committee as okay. well thank you anyone else are there any other questions anyone in the audience have any Concerns or questions? Good. Uh, yes, sir. Please come forward. Yep. If you would, uh, welcome to the committee, first of all, and, and if you would, please identify yourself and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Pong Zhang, Director of the Driver and Vehicle Services Division, and I want to thank Representative Engen for bringing this uh, bill to this committee. Um, DVS is in support of, H, uh, of this, uh, this bill, HF 904, and um, uh, the representative did a, did a great job explaining what it does, and I just want to just add that um, in practice, DVS is accepting DAV as 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 congressionally um, and, and accept or sort of chartered veteran service. Uh, this this correction just allows us to reflect that in the statute. And additionally, for Gold Star families, we are not charging the $100 fee, uh, but again, as as a clarification of the statute, so that we could continue that practice. Um, and have that reflected in the law as well. So thank you very much. Good, thank you, Mr. John. Okay, uh, seeing no further questions. Yes, uh, Representative <laughs> Mary Francis. Thank you, Chair Newton. Uh, thank you, Rep, for bringing the bill. I think it's great. Um, 
do you have any idea the amount of people that would be under this or like any numbers around that? I think that it clarifies, um, I, I heard actually today, uh, that 18,000 uh, current Gold Star families under the DAV program are, are eligible for this. So, um, yeah, for the record, that's, that's a great question to ask so we can make sure that they know that they're eligible for this. Great. Thank you so much. Thank I you. I think any time we deal with uh, license plates, uh, you know, if, if there's not a sufficient number uh, involved, uh, there, it's going nowhere. So. Good. Again, uh, Representative Engen, thank you. Uh, and I renew my motion and House File 904 be re referred to the Transportation Committee. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Oh, yes, I have to have a vote. <laughs> All in favor of moving uh, House File 904 to the Transportation Committee, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Good. You're on your way. Is Representative Freiburg here? Oh, good. <laughs> Good afternoon, Representative Freiburg. Welcome Hello. to the committee. Yeah, thank you. Glad to be here. Uh, Representative Freiburg, I move that House File 236 be re-referred to the House Taxes Committee. So if you would, please identify yourself and then proceed with your testimony. Sure. Uh, Mike Freiburg, uh, State Representative. I understand there's a uh, DE1 amendment, too, that okay. I think you may want to move. I, I'll move the DE1 amendment. Thanks. Would you like to explain the, the amendment? Sure, sure. The amendment does a couple things. Um, so this relates to the market value homestead exclusion for disabled veterans. Uh, the amendment raises the disability exclusion from 330000 to 400000 and makes it proportional <coughs> to the veteran's disability rating um, if it's over 70%. It adjusts the 400000 figure for inflation, um, and it allows an, a surviving spouse to reapply for the exclusion. Good. Um, so do we have to move the, that? Okay. Uh, all in favor of moving the uh, DE1 amendment, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. Okay. So the amendment is on the bill. And uh, do you have uh, testifiers, Mr. Fruit? I don't. Okay. If you would like to explain the, the bill for us. Sure. The bill was requested by a couple constituents of mine who are disabled veterans. Uh, the, the disabled veteran homestead exclusion allows veterans with a disability rating of 70% or higher to, de to deduct some of the value of their home from property taxes. The exclusion uh, was created in recognition of the service and sacrifice our disabled veterans provided. Further, many of the more seriously disabled vets have had to make substantial improvements to their homes for access, such as wider doors, access to toilets and sinks, cabinets and cupboards, chair lifts and bed lifts. So having, um, having this exclusion just makes sense. Uh, for a surviving spouse in a house that has had all of those changes, it becomes more difficult to sell the home and move into a smaller home without having to go through major expenses to the home the vet was living in. Unfortunately, we've had the same exclusion amounts since the provision was first established in 2008. Um, under current law for veterans with a disability rating of at least 70%, the exclusion amount is $150,000. This means that prior to calculating taxes on the home, $150,000 is subtracted from the home's value. For veterans with a disability rating of 100%, um, uh, their total or permanent disability, the exclusion amount is $300,000. Uh, the amount of the exclusion should not remain stagnant for 15 years, um, increasing the amount to reflect increased costs in society is a common sense change that furthers the goal of assisting disabled veterans. Um, I hope members will support this uh, common sense piece of legislation. Good. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Yes, Representative Weins. Yes, uh, Mr. Chair and Representative Freiberg, hey, thanks for bringing this uh, very important legislation forward to adjust for the market value changes, inflation, all those things that veterans are feeling. Uh, there, are, there are several thought processes that are going here, and I know of one where it was to add a 50% uh, disability level, um, and possibly that's something we can uh, discuss at a future, uh, future session. But I think this is, is excellent. Um, it, it enables all those things, uh, honoring service, as well as recognizing uh, uh, what's going on in the economy and all. So I plan to support this. Thank you much, uh, Representative Freiberg. Mr. Chair. Representative Wilson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So the one, the one aspect of this that is a little bit concerning to me is the automatic inflationary uh, aspect of this. 
can you tell me when this original, the 300,000 market value mark was placed into statute? And then can you tell me how long in the last couple of years it's been where, where the, the value of the house has grossly exceeded what that, that <laughs> value is? And the reason why I'm asking is because I, I think that what we've seen is the reactionary ability of this committee to do the right thing with regard to home values. You know, it's just within the last two years that we've seen housing values skyrocket as a result of a lot of different things, not just including inflation, but there's been a lot of new houses purchased on this market. It's driving everyone's values up. And I believe that our committee has been incredibly reactionary, very quick to respond to this as an issue. So I'm wondering when was this first established into our uh, state statute with the $300,000 mark? And then how long have we seen this disconnect between home values? Because if it's, uh, you know, we've seen bills where you know, something hasn't been touched for 20, 25, 30 years, and we're saying, wow, this, this is really out of, out of mark. But it's, to my understanding, this has only been a year, a year or two, where we've seen this disconnect, and I believe that this committee has done a great job of reacting to it. I think that putting it on autopilot is potentially an unwise thing for the state to do. I think that we are throwing the keys... Uh, to the vehicle and saying, here, drive this thing for us. Uh, that's a concern of mine. Great bill. Great idea. I love it. I'm just concerned about the inflation autopilot idea. Can you explain that, please? Representative Bradley. Sure. Uh, thank you, Representative Olson. Yeah, the uh, $300,000 figure was put into place in 2008. Um, so, uh, you know, in my mind, raising from raising it from 300000 to $400,000, you know, I haven't done an exact calculation in terms of what the inflationary amount during that 15-year period would be, um, but it seems like an approximate value, um, you know, and I know counties have some concerns about potentially losing the, the property tax base also. So th it seems like a reasonable effort to me, I, and I think putting in an inflationary adjustment, you know, does help recogni recognition that. I mean, it's great to hear this committee has been uh, quick to react um, and has been pretty, has been a pretty nimble committee, but I, you know, the fact that this hasn't been raised in 15 years says to me that um, having this automatic inflationary adjustment in there is, is appropriate um, and will ensure that there's at least a minimum uh, level of, of increase. And if there is uh, like a dramatic increase that in home values that exceeds the, the rate of inflation, hopefully the nimbleness of this committee will enable <coughs> it to revisit the amount and adjust it higher still. Representative Wilson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I would just kind of close by saying that there there tends to be a lot of, uh, you look at the United States military's composition today, about 60% of the military comes from less than 20% of the population. You talk about rural Minnesotans, rural Americans, tend to serve their country at a rate that far exceeds those of the inner city. And so when we're talking about uh, doing something to assist veterans, uh, we have to also kind of tie it into the fact that a county's government does in fact uh, receive an kind of a disproportionate level of effect when you're talking about a rural county versus an urban county. Uh, one of my counties in particular, like Watanwan County, for example, even, a, even 10, 15, 20 of these veterans actually is a significant portion of the budget that's being shifted to other people when you've got 9,000 people living in a community instead of the, the half a million people that live in some of the more urban portions of the state. So very, very good idea. I, I support it absolutely, but I think I just want us to think about it from a rural urban portion as well because this does heavily affect a rural scenario and I don't think that there's any rural Minnesotan who would say no, I think my veterans should have to pay. I think my 100% disabled veterans should have to pay more, um, but it's something we need to understand and just look at when we're talking about good government. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for having this heard. Yeah. Great, great idea. Thank you, Representative Wilson. I I think the number is something like 14 to 18,000 statewide that would qualify under this. Uh, so, and it's one of the issues, Representative Weens, if we go to 50%, we'd have to look at how many people we're gonna be covering because there are many more people at 50% <coughs> than there are at 70 or 100%. So, uh, are there any other questions? <laughs> any concerns? Representative Clarity. I just have a comment, thank you. Um, Chair Newton and Rep. Um, I really like how the exclusion piece was um, as far as um, allowing families to um, apply for it. Um, having that two-year piece taken away 
because during a time of death, people are in such you know crisis, they can't even think to process that. So I really appreciate that. I think that's really gonna help a lot of veterans. And then there is another um, allowance along the, same, along the same way. So thank you for doing that. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments, questions? Anyone in the audience would like to testify? Seeing none, um, I renew my motion that uh, House File 236, as amended, be re-referred to the House Taxes Committee. So thank you, uh, Representative Freiberg, for bringing this forward. Thank you. Oh, I've got to vote again. <laughs> so not used to it. <laughs> All in favor of moving House File 236 as amended to the uh, Taxes Committee, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Good. Thank you. Now you're on your way. Thank you. Well. Representative Bliss. I think you have testifiers also. Yep. Yeah. Representative Bliss, welcome to our committee. Um, would you like to move your bill, House File 1194? I, I would, Mr. Chair. And okay. we also have an amendment. Yes, you have an author's amendment. Yes, I do, and I'd like to move the author's amendment. Okay, would you please uh, explain your amendment, Representative Bliss? Sure. Um, on the... Uh, uh, paid it, basically it's just taking out the uh, the language that allows the money to be used for uh, repairs and maintenance of, of the facility uh, we feel as, as uh, uh, veterans that, that we feel the money would be best spent uh, being spent on the veterans themselves so that's why we're doing that okay good so uh, all in favor of the amendment please signify by uh, s s saying aye. 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 aye aye opposed good so the amendment is on the bill and if you uh, would please explain your bill representative bliss thank you mr chair house file 1194 uh authorizes uh one hundred and fifty thousand dollars uh annually i believe it is uh to a an organization that runs a, a facility in walker minnesota uh, by the name of camp bliss and i want to state for the record this has no <laughs> affiliation with myself my company or my family so get that out of the way I do appreciate them honoring me and naming their camp after me. <laughs> uh, in all seriousness, this is a really good place. Uh, they they uh, they do a lot of good things for veterans and first responders with PTSD. And uh, anything I would say would be uh, not nearly as el eloquent as my guests. So I'm going to let the testifier take over from here. Good, thank you. And uh, if you would please identify yourself for the record and then proceed with the testimony, ma'am. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm Kara Ruff. I'm the founder and executive director of Independent Lifestyles in Camp Bliss. I'm here to ask for your support on House File 1194. And I'm here today because veterans in Minnesota are in crisis. And I see that every time we facilitate a retreat for them. Throughout the US, uh, veterans are not getting the support resources or assistance they need to thrive, especially after deployment. I urge the Minnesota State Legislature to fund Camp Bliss so that we can continue to provide the wellness and therapeutic experiences that provide lasting changes, actually save marriages, create wellness and resiliency, and provide for the social networks that the vest veterans are desperate to be part of. What hundreds of veterans have told me over the past few years is that they need more community-based services. They need opportunities to express their deepest grief where it will not be added to their service file. They would need confidential opportunities to be vulnerable, to heal, and to bond with other service members with shared experiences. They often tell me how isolated and alone they feel and do not know how to repair the damage that their service caused. When soldiers returned home, they often feel that the worst is behind them. They got, they got back alive, and they're free from the fear of dying. But many are unprepared for civilian life, but somehow yet expected to manage this. I just came from Camp Bliss. I facilitated a veterans and spouses retreat all weekend. And one of them so eloquent, eloquently said, 
you know, they, they do a great job of teaching us how to conduct ourselves and live our lives while we have our uniform and our boots on. But when that uniform and those boots come off, we're left on our own and we don't know how to cope anymore. And, and we still feel like we have to wear that shield with us at all times. Another veteran that was there with his wife uh, had not been able to express emotion uh, since Vietnam. And for the first time in, in all these years was able to actually break down with emotion and become vulnerable. Afterwards, his wife came up to me and thanked me with tears in her eyes and said, Wait, you don't know how many decades we've been waiting for this breakthrough. Thank you. It, it will help our families. We're still losing approximately 23 veterans a day to suicide. This statistic is a stark reminder that soldiers need much more than just medical services to recover, regenerate, and thrive. A VA uh, report and statement underlined just how complex of an epidemic it really is. Officials in charge explain that the department is simply incapable of addressing the issue and that it needs help from the private sector to pro properly tackle it. The executive in charge of Veterans Health Administration said we cannot do this alone and we call on our community partners to join their effort. Over the past few, year, year, few years, we have served um, 419 veterans and their family members. At Camp List, the veterans are in charge. We create and facilitate customized retreats based on the feedback we receive and therefore provide a wide array of services to help veterans gain the level of support that they deserve. The array of services includes PTSD, Gold Star families, veterans and spouses, military sexual trauma, suicide prevention, caregivers, and much, much more. The wellness retreats for our female veterans have also exploded as the female veteran population has been significantly overlooked and underserved. With $150,000 in funding, we can serve up to approximately 176 veterans and their families with life-changing experiences every year. We conduct pre and post evaluations to monitor health and well-being and gather feedback at every opportunity. We pride ourselves on being account accountable and transparent. We created Camp List with no direct funding for veteran services. We did it because not doing it would have been an outrage. It was and is the right thing to do. And now we look to the Minnesota legislature to invest in what truly is working in our community, which is cost effective and what prevents exploding medical and mental health costs and allows veterans to live with dignity, respect, uh, and support that they deeply and drastically need and deserve. And that would come in House File 1194. I do have uh, five very brief veteran testimonies from their experiences at Camp List that I'd like to share with you. If we can get it to work, the sound. <laughs> I served in the United States Air Force from 1963 to 67. I, uh, a veteran, I volunteer at the VA and I talk to a lot of veterans. I come to Camp Bliss with a lot of expectations. I have fun and man, I tell you, these people treat you well. I fish with a lot of guys that never had the opportunity to ever fish before. And it was so fun helping them and watching them and they appreciate it so much, there was actually tears in their eyes. It was, it's, it's a wonderful thing for these veterans. You know, they've done a lot of things and it, for the cost that it costs to do this, it's amazing how much joy a veteran, the retired veteran that cannot even ever think about going fishing or hunting or anything. And what Camp Bliss does for us is a truly an amazing honor. Thank you, Cam Bliss, and thank you for all of you people that support us. It's a wonderful, wonderful deal. Thank you. Hello, my name is Robbie Jankowski. Uh, I was in the Army from 1987 to 1994. Uh, I had the pleasure of coming to Camp Bliss on a fishing outing. Uh, everything has just been wonderful, from the food to the hospitality and the camaraderie with the vets that I made and friends probably for a long life. And uh, the things that are done here and across the state for the veterans of North Dakota, or for Minnesota, excuse me, uh, are just phenomenal. And they need more help, uh, but this is a very good program. So uh, I would uh, raise money for it if you can. Uh, money makes everything go around and this is a very well-deserved program. I uh, feel honored that I was able to come up here. Thank you very much. 
and have a good night. Rich Lane, uh, Camp Bliss was a blissful stay. I really needed it bad. Um, I was going through some rough times myself, uh, not only through family, uh, loss of family members and everything. This was a vacation well needed. Um, thank you so much for helping other veterans uh, having the opportunity to do this. I uh, have three combat tours, uh, Kosovo, Afghanistan, and just got back from Africa in 2021. Um, I cannot say anything bad about this place. This place is well needed by a lot of vets, not only myself, but other, other ones, as including um, your, your Vietnam vets. I feel more connected with other vets now being here because you make long life friendship with those veterans. And uh, I've made four or five new veteran friends that uh, I will be keeping on my speed dial from here out. Thank you. Hi, my name is Brandon Treadwell. I served in the Minnesota Army National Guard. I've done one combat tour over in Africa. Uh, Camp Bliss, this whole weekend has been absolutely wonderful. It was well needed. Um, since I've been struggling financially and stressful, it got my mind off of everything. I can just relax and feel comfort free of anything. Um, just a much needed time. Connected with so many veterans here. I met probably four or five more that I shared similar experiences with. And overall, just a much needed thing for me. Uh, Hi, uh, my name is Alan Tate. I'm a uh, medically retired Marine. Uh, I've been on Reaper for quite a while, but it's still incredible to get together with other vets and just the sense of camaraderie we get by getting together and talking about stuff that only vets understand. And then to have people like this that come and, uh, <laughs> come and help us out and, and go so far above and beyond for us is incredible. So I would, I would, as a taxpayer and voter, heavy, heavy voter, I would really like to see my Minnesota government, federal government, everything support groups like this and these people especially because what they've done for us this weekend, I cannot say enough about this is the most incredible thing I've done in a very long time. And uh, you know, just God bless these people for doing this. And I would really like, again, to say I love you people to uh, support these people and give them what they need because they need it. Good. Thank you, uh, Ms. Ruff. Is there anyone else that would like to uh, testify? Okay, does anyone have any questions of uh, the testifiers or uh, Representative Bliss? Seeing none, yes? Oh, yes, Representative Weins. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, Representative Bliss and uh, Ms. Karp. Um, I, I'm glad to see and hear that you include family members. And for those of us uh, that have served um, over recent years, the expansion include uh, family members is needed indeed. And um, the reintegration process that many of us have gone through would not be complete without having our families or uh, those that are um, you know, our families. Um, you had mentioned that th the, the appropriation here would go to 176 visits. Um, in the previous amount, how many Minnesota veterans um, have gone gone through your program this rep <coughs> mr. chair representative thank you um, I just want to speak to your first point um, adding the family members was absolutely crucial for us because as you've heard even in other testimonies it's not just the veteran that serves and um, in these spouses retreats there's so much healing that needs to happen within the relationship and just for the spouse as well so thank you um, like I said, we've served 419 um, to date. And where's my sheet? Sorry. So, um, because we were not previously able to count uh, family members at all. Uh, so in 2023, we've already served um, 49 veterans. That was out without last weekend, so that would be 59 veterans as of just 2023 already. Uh, in 2022, we served 85. 
um, plus eight family members. In 2021, uh, we served 44 plus four family members. In 2020, during the height of the pandemic, we still serve 14 and 11 family members. But of course, pandemic years were pretty tough and we had to cancel a lot of them. So they're desperate to get back in full action. Okay, Representative yep. Weeks. Yep. Uh, Mr. Chair and uh, Representative Bliss, um, thank you very much uh, for that data. I think it's important for us to know that uh, any money that we put forward for a great program like this, as we did with uh, Veterans on the Lake and Helmets to Hard Hats, all of those things, um, we do want to have a tracking to make certain that the program is serving our veterans. And um, with that, I just I intend to support this. So thank you very much, Mr. Thank Chair. Thank you. Uh, yes, Ms. Brock. Mr. Chair and Representative, I just want to reiterate, um, the Department of Veterans Affairs does a very good job. They hold us very accountable. We have to provide DD-214s um, and a lot of documentation for every single veteran we serve. And of course, again, we collect um, pre and post surveys on everybody. We pride ourselves on that accountability, so thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So really quick, I, I greatly appreciate the fact that on the back page here it talks about anyone who is considered a, a veteran would also be a current Armed Forces member while serving in the active or reserve component. And I'd just like to take a quick moment to, to not really educate the committee, but to talk about what it's like to be in the reserves. Uh, what we do is uh, I could at any point in time be picked up for a deployment if a unit that is deploying needs a captain within the reserves, anywhere within the federal government. If they say, hey, you know, this unit in New York City needs a captain and we've got a captain here in Minnesota, he's ready to go and they could pick me up and they could go. And so the support that that is formed in a unit like this or in an organization like this, whereas I could come back from that deployment and not have a single story to talk to with any of my other members because I was the only one who got picked up for that deployment. It happens regularly. One of the saddest things or one of the toughest, it wasn't sad, it was very tough for me. Uh, a number of years ago when I was in command, I received a notification from a much higher entity. Our division said, you need to fill these slots. They're going on deployment. Pick them. And I got a spreadsheet that said, here are the jobs that we need filled, and here are the soldiers within your unit who have those jobs. And I had to look at these individuals and know that their families were going to be separated for a year's time, and I had to be the one who chose it. Uh, the most, you know, we did what we could to make people, you know, there were people who said, hey, I get to go with my friend. I'm happy to do so. We had people volunteer, but the toughest one, and I'll never forget it, uh, she was a good friend of mine who was the only person in the unit who had that job-specific uh, position and uh, she had a, she had three kids uh, recently. You know, it was it was very tough. And I, I, I called her on the phone and I said, I am so sorry. You are the only person you have to go. And that was very tough. And she came back from that deployment, not being able to share any of those stories with any of the people who had, who she served with currently because she didn't go with them. So I appreciate the fact that you are bringing soldiers together, including the ones who are in the reserve component component, so they can share those stories with people who don't currently have them. But I did have one quick question. Um, I just want to make sure that every one of these uh, individuals, the $150,000 that we're going to be spending, those are all Minnesota veterans, correct? Someone from New York is not going to be able to take advantage of Minnesota taxpayer right. dollars. Mr. Chair, Representative, that's correct. They are all Minnesota veterans and, and um, MDVA in, ensures that as well. We do have uh, veterans who come have flown in from across the United States because it, it's unbelievable how necessary these services are. So that's quite a statement about how important they are. But we do not um, use this funding. We raise other funds to support them if they should come in from out of state. Are there any other questions, concerns? Good. Well, thank you. Um, so I renew the motion that House File 1194, as amended, uh, be laid over for possible inclusion. So thank you, uh, Ms. Ruff, and thank you, Representative Bliss, for bringing this forward. Thank you for hearing us, Mr. Chair. And Representative Clardy, I'm glad you're here. Me too. <laughs> And Representative Clardy, as you're coming up, I believe you have uh, testifiers also. Um, yes, I have a couple from uh, okay. the Veterans Resi er, um, Resilience Project, and I also have Jacob Fry. 
Okay. So, I'm sorry, uh, Jacob Thomas. I was thanking the governor, or I mean the, the uh, mayor. <laughs> Uh, Representative Clarity, if you would identify yourself for the record and then uh, move your bill to the committee. Yes, my name is Mary, uh, Representative Mary Frances Clarity, and I'd like to move um, House File 1353. Good, thank you. So the bill is before us. Uh, would you like to tell us about the bill? Yes, uh, briefly. <laughs> Um, so I'm really excited to be here to have a bill that's going to make a difference and has made a difference with um, families that are veterans. And um, so this is really good. Its um, companion bill in the Senate is 1509, which is sponsored by um, Senators Mitchell, Klein, and Morrison. So this bill will allow spouses and their current military service members, spouses, um, to receive I movement desensitization, um, and it's it was uh, the Veterans Resiliency Project was appropriated in 2021, Chapter 12, Article um, 37, and therefore the initial bill was approved to only include the military members, and so this bill that I'm bringing forward to you today is to include their spouses. Um, because of the because of the success that they've had already, and it's also to extend it for an additional two years. Um, so we've been hearing about some symptoms of PTSD. So untreated, um, it can include like you know reliving a lot of traumatic events and flashbacks and nightmares and depression and you know avoidance of families and friends. So this too can affect families and just communities and how one operates within. And it's especially um, the Department of um, Veter or Military Veterans has um, noted that the PTSD will affect or can affect like marriage relationship problems and parenting or, or um, poor family functioning. So we wanna make sure that our veterans have every tool that they need to be successful. Um, and so one of our witnesses here, I'm not gonna talk too much, is going to kind of describe what the program is and how it actually really works. The appropriation amount is $400,000 for the fiscal year 2024, and then another 400,000 for the fiscal year 2025. And it would be appropriated from general funds to the Commissioner of Veterans Affairs for a grant to, veteran, to the Veteran Resiliency Project, which is a fabulous nonprofit, and they'll tell you all about their purpose. Um, and um, just a quick little personal story. I called a friend of mine that um, I've known since college, so I've known him for 45 years, and he was a lieutenant colonel, and I'm like, I um, just wanted to talk to you about this bill that I have, and do you know anyone that, you know, that could benefit from this. And he said, well, you know, I would have been one of those people. And in fact, he, he was one of the people that um, Governor Tim Walls reported to. <laughs> so anyway, I thought that was kind of a neat connection. But um, I'm not gonna go um, much further. I'm gonna turn it over to the experts. Th thank you, Representative Clarity. And uh, is it Ms. Phillips? Correct. Yes, uh, if you would identify yourself for the record, please. Yes, sir. this is uh, Mr. Marchley. Uh, I'm Eric Pull up Wicks. a chair. And I appreciate that. I'm just going to take a minute here. My name is Eric Wickheiser. I'm the chairman of the Board of Veteran Resilience Project. Just want to make a little slight change there. We're not, we're not plural, we're singular. And I want to thank you, uh, uh, Chairman Newton and uh, uh, Representative Clarity, Clarity to bringing this bill up. It's very important to us. Uh, the legislature's, I'm gonna calm down because I'm a little nervous <laughs> here. <laughs> but what I wanna do is um, we've talked to, um, um, Senator, Anderson, Senator Anderson and um, <clears throat> Representative Bliss, who's a fellow Navy veteran and Senator Bennett, and that we're trying to get the input of all so that we get all sides, get all the questions answered. I'm gonna turn this over to uh, Major Jonna Phillips, who is our therapy director. Good, thank you. 
Major Phillips, we're back <laughs> back with you. If I, you'd identify yourself, please. My name is Jonna Phillips. Um, good afternoon, Chairman Newton and committee members. Uh, I'm a I am the therapy Pro program director for Veterans Resilience Project, a licensed marriage family therapist. Actually, a professor of mine was Dr. Tina Weens. Um, so I appreciate that. Um, that's why I'm such a good therapist now. <laughs> so, uh, but I am also a spouse of an active duty Army veteran and have served for almost 23 years in the Air National Guard. Currently, I am a major and the director of equal opportunity at the 148th Fighter Wing in Duluth, Minnesota, and work on the sexual harassment task force for the Minnesota Air National Guard. I thank you for this dedicated time to speak about the vital importance of veterans' mental health. And I'm here to ask you to support our bill, House File 1353, which would allow us to support not only the veteran and service members, but their spouses. Overall, we do see that there is a reduction in stigmatization around seeking mental health support. However, embedded in the military culture is the call to serve others before yourself or the belief that one should be able to handle it. I often have to tell my military clients, yes, they are soldiers, but they are humans as well. As a Minnesota nonprofit, Veterans Resilience Project staff and board, we work tirelessly to reduce barriers to care. Um, our goal is to effectively treat post-traumatic stress disorder and trauma, including military sexual trauma, amongst Minnesota veterans. ERP does this by providing and building awareness of EMDR therapy, which stands for Eye Movement Desensitization and Reprocessing. In 2012, our founder, Elaine Wynn, who's also here, um, also a therapist and a veteran spouse, conducted a pilot program specifically providing EMDR therapy to Minnesota veterans. The re results were significant in that 77% of veterans completed the course of treatment and 100% had a decrease in their PTSD symptoms. With the funding, VRP has focused on increasing the number of our therapists in our network. We've provided two advanced EMDR trainings this past year Therapists that come to our training are already traumaologists or EMDR experts. We just provide additional um, training on EMDR and deepen their therapy skills that they already have. 50% um, of these therapists offer telehealth services to increase access to care, ensuring we serve veterans in rural Minnesota. We have another training already scheduled for May that will be held in Duluth, um, supporting our efforts um, advancing in the northern region. Additionally, I think it's important to understand we are very dedicated to edu ed educating veterans, service members, families, and the community and veteran organizations that PTSD and trauma <coughs> symptoms are not just something a veteran has to live with, but rather there's effective treatment that reduces symptoms and increases quality of life. EMDR for your um, awareness is recognized by the National Center for PTSD the VA, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, and the World Health Organization is one of the most researched therapy modalities for PTSD, and it's considered one of the top methods of treatment. EMDR allows the trauma memory to be reprocessed, allowing the disturbing memory to be stored as a standard memory where it no longer causes distress. Research shows that EMDR reduces symptoms of PTSD, flashbacks, nightmares, and anxiety. It improves sleep, and due to it having a somatic component, reduces the tension the body holds. And one therapist noted recently that 80, um, our body holds 80% of our trauma. <laughs> Since receiving the grant, we have attended over 16 events, reaching out to over 2,000 service members and their families. We have had over 200 contact cards filled out requesting to get started with EMDR specifically. Research identifies that the uh, conversion rate for, um, is typically around 10% and even lower when it comes to mental health services due to additional barriers. Therefore, we are consistently and constantly reaching out to these veterans and service members who have shown interest. <coughs> As we attended events this past year, we noticed a significant pattern of veteran spouses asking about whether they too could have access to this EMDR therapy through VRP. And that is why we are here today to share this message on their behalf. We ask that you support House File 1353 and allow spouses to have the same access to EMDR through VRP. 
Spouses have identified that they have been holding their own invisible wounds. Mm -hmm. This is often due to spouses' heightened focus on the veteran's mental health and the energy needed to minimize the impact of trauma on the family system. As a military spouse, I can tell you we normalize separations, moves, isolation, witnessing PTSD symptoms, compassion fatigue, loss, unexpected family stressors as something we do without recognizing the impacts of our own mental health. The, the addition of the spouse would utilize, excuse me, the addition of including the spouse would utilize funding that is already in place. Um, the VRP is funded with an appropriation of 400,000 per year. And we would ask that this would continue through 2026. We work extremely hard with our grant manager, ensuring the funding is both ethically and responsibly managed. Um, our organization, its goal is to build a sustainable organization that reflects a diversity of funding sources. Uh, we plan to raise an additional um, 1,050, excuse me, 1,050 to expand our outreach program. The additional funding supports operation expense as well as hiring outreach coordinators. The work we are doing can have a profound impact on Minnesota veterans and service members and with your support, their spouses. Um, we are dedicated to increasing the quality of life for all Minnesota veterans and service members suffering with PTSD and trauma and by providing evidence-based accessible therapy, um, we believe we will create lifelong change. Good, thank you. Does, uh, yes, Representative Olson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So just a quick question. Um, how much money does it cost to send one veteran through this entire session from beginning to conclusion? So Ms. that Phillips, was, yeah. Oh yeah, thank you, um, Chairman. Um, we it is one hundred and twenty-five dollars per session, and we provide twelve free sessions. Um, and so, if I can do the math, I think that's one thousand twelve hundred and fifty dollars. Um, and that is a pride point as a therapist. Um, we really want to take care of not only the veterans, but the therapists that are providing this. And so I think that is a very reasonable rate. Um, um, and i um, not sure if you're all aware, but therapists are pretty burnt out right now as well. And so it is um, a, a really great way of taking care of them as they're taking care of our veterans. Representative Olson. Yeah, so uh, I just you know did some quick math. So $400,000 appropriated through our budget here. Uh, at $125 per session times tw up to 12 sessions per individual. That means that for $400,000, we could effectively treat 266.66 veterans, so someone who doesn't complete the program entirely. Uh, my concern here is whereas I think that's a great, great and honorable cause to treat veterans, 266 plus, you know, two-thirds veterans, uh, if everyone's spouse gets that as well, that means that effectively we are treating 133 veterans, 133 individuals who have gone into the face of danger and have come out, and they've come out in a scarred way that needs and deserves this treatment. I'm not, I'm not trying to, uh, to say that a spouse's trauma is, is not relevant or not uh, in need of some form of care, but when, when I'm looking at it, I'm saying we could effectively reach 266 veterans and treat them for their for the, the trauma that they've sustained, I think that that's potentially a more honorable thing for us to be doing than just treating 133 veterans. And I know not every spouse would do it. I understand this, I understand, but when we're really looking down at it, we desperately owe these veterans everything we possibly can to get them right. You know, they went out, they served our country, they went into the face of danger and they came out and they came out scarred, but they still came out, and we owe everything we possibly can to those members, and I would, uh, I would desperately advocate that we treat 266 of them every year instead of 133. Uh, Ms. Yes. Phillips, if you, you have a response. Yeah. And I appreciate that so much, um, being married to uh, a veteran with PTSD. Um, the part I would advocate for the spouses is, um, you know, I'm the one who's holding his trauma just as much as him. And so um, I've experienced the deployments. I've experienced him waking up in the night with cold sweats. Um, I have witnessed um, him losing friends to the death by suicide. And so um, I do think, 
your point is very valid. And I, I think the part of the funding, um, we would be responsibly managing that. And that's also why we're raising other additional funding as well. Um, because we do feel like treating the spouses also opens the door for the veterans. Um, I don't know if you know, I'm sure you know this, but sometimes the veterans are a harder client. Um, but if their spouse goes in and gets um, support, often that leads them to being willing to take that step as well. So that's my, my point of argument there. Thank you. Representative Hudeno. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I've got a series of questions, so I'll, I'll come back through you. Um, Great mission, love it. Um, I had a long time in the Army as well. Um, know a, a number of the members up at the 148th. Um, and I've got some experience on, on the military nonprofit side as well. So love the mission, love everything about it. But I've got some concerns on the business side um, that I'd like to either ask you or, or your board chair. Um, and, and the first one is, um, I don't see your tax ID number on your website. It's required to be there if you're soliciting donations, which you are. Thank you for Represent noting Ms. that. Phillips, yeah. yeah, we will probably put that on there today. Okay. So I appreciate that. I think we um, just transferred to a new website. Um, and so that has just not transferred over. Okay. Mr. Chair. Um, also, when I when I was checking out the organization, I, I see multiple PO boxes um, registered in different cities. There's a four-digit one in Minnetonka, a five-digit one in Minneapolis. Just wondering if, but I didn't see any physical location. Do you, do you have a physical office location? Yeah. Right, yeah. Now, yeah. Yeah. right now, we don't have a physical location because we're we're uh, doing everything on Zoom. You know, based on the pandemic and that, and that which has been hard for everybody. So uh, we, we just recently, we do have a brick and mortar, which happens to be my, my home. And then we also have the PO box, which is near my post office. So uh, eventually, as we get along, we will need extra funds to get an office, you know, because we would like a brick and mortar place, but we, we don't have that ability right now. Sure. I've got just a couple more, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you. Uh, do you know what your charitable giving percentage is? Ms. Phillips? Uh, Wait, Jack, can you, can you explain that? I'm, I'm not sure what you're getting at. Sure. Mr. Chair. Yes. Uh, so a charitable giving percentage, um, if you run a nonprofit organization, um, it's, it's probably one of the biggest numbers that's talked about on a regular basis, or at least that donors want to see. Um, it's, it's the percentage of your revenues that are used for actual mission work. We have that. I just yeah. don't have it in front of me, um, but I can definitely email you with those okay. numbers. Yes. That'd be great. And Ms. Phillips, if you would send it to the entire committee. Yes. Uh, Two more, Mr. Done. Chair, and I'll be done. Um, uh, the next, uh, so you guys are currently filing annually the IRS 990N is in November, um, which is a postcard filing meant for organizations that are um, taking in $50,000 or less in revenues. Um, your revenues obviously far exceed that. Can you tell me why you're filing that postcard? Uh, it's, it's not the correct form to file. Mr. Wiggins, you're, you're, ab you're absolutely correct um, that we have filed a 990N, and that we did that because of the uh, we were under the uh, amount of money required to file the actual 990s. This the, this year for 2022, we will file. We're in the process of building that right now, the uh, the full 990 with all of the information because uh, people need to know that. And we didn't um, just to, we did not receive um, the signing of the grant and funding until March of 2022, and so that this will be our first year with that funding, and that's why we're filing the full 990. Last one. Yeah. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, 
external audit. I, I couldn't find an external audit on your organization either, and, and I, I don't exactly know the answer to this question yet. You're required by state law if you have $750,000 or more in, in revenues. Um, if you haven't hit that yet, um, great. Uh, if uh, it, it sounds like with this uh, potential appropriation that you would, so it would be my expectation if you come back to the committee in, in the future that there's a, a copy of that external financial audit. Um, you'll actually derive your charitable giving percentage out of that as well. Um, and, and I think what I'm getting at um, for you and, and for the committee members, um, the mission is awesome. You got to make sure that the business side of the house is, is squared away too. Um, it's something that not only your donors, but this committee is going to be very interested if, if you continue to come to um, the committee for more appropriations. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Uh, Representative Bennett. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, uh, thank you for presenting, and I enjoyed speaking with you in my office as well. And some of the questions here I've gotten at, uh, at the answers I was looking for, at least some of that information. I would like to see more uh, breakdown of, of what the funding goes for in the different pockets and so on. Um, but I do have a question for the bill author, author Representative Clarity. Thank mm -hmm. you for carrying this on. And I'm not, in, in asking this question, I'm not questioning the effectiveness of, of this therapy. Actually, I, I like alternative therapies or different types, and I think it's good to try these things. But uh, my question is, have you considered, Representative Clarity, having um, a reporting requirement in here that actually measures the effectiveness of the therapy and reports that, that it's built into this bill? Because I think it's so important, and I've been working on this on education where we're working with so many nonprofits uh, that we give grants to, that we always have an effectiveness component built in. So is that something that maybe I missed, it's in the bill, or, or if it's not in there, would you consider adding a component? Representative Clarity. Thank you, Chair Newton. Thank you, Rep. Um, it is in the grant. So um, I am a data person, so I think I, I really respect that question. So yeah, so if you look in the grant, it's, it's in there, delineated in there. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's good to hear. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Representative Weins. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative uh, uh, Clardy and Director Phillips. Um, thank you. And I think you've heard some kind of tough questions from this side. Um, one of the things, uh, as a freshman, uh, I came in, it's like, I want to change the world. Well, maybe I can't change the world, but maybe I can do a little bit for those people that I've served with, uh, that have become friends with, or their family members uh, of veterans. Um, and as we ask these questions, it, it is not to doubt that your intent and everything, it is that we want to see results. Uh, for those of us that have served, it's the mission intent. We want to have measurable effects that we are hitting where we're at. And you'll get, for customers, you'll get no one that's more pernicious, I think, than a veteran. It's what's the juice for the squeeze? Mm -hmm. Is Does this work? And, and maybe it only works for 30%, 50% of folks. Um, I think that's probably, it's probably worth it figuring that out. Uh, but we need to know. And um, I guess this question probably goes to Representative Clardy. It could go to Director Phillips or Mr. Wickeiser. Um, is, is the research that is done, is it tied to a research institute like the University of Minnesota or Mayo? Or um, what, what's the connective tissue for your research and database? Well, the research um, comes a lot from what's called the EMDRIA. Um, it's Eye Movement Desensitization Reprocessing institution association and so it uh, actually on the handouts we um, passed around for all of you the last page on that has all of our resources which documents where the research has um, come out of as well um, and so there have been over 30 um, studies since the late 1980s when this was first founded um, by Francine Shapiro our pilot pro program also, again, showed 100% um, of reduction of PTSD symptoms. And the other part of that that's really important to know is um, 
veterans are a difficult um, population to actually complete treatment, <coughs> and 77% of those completed the treatment, which is a, a really, I, I don't want to underplay, uh, underplay the significance of that. But besides the pilot program, again, it's one of the most research modalities, and um, again, that's why we actually included the references on the back for all of you. And what I will do is, along with the budget, I will send um, those references to you as well. One, one follow means, yes. Yeah, Mr. Please. Chair, um, thank you. I, I, I think what you've heard, at least you know, from Representative Bennett and also Representative Hudella, is we would like to get the feedback and reports from this. And uh, I, I cannot stress enough, if there is a local D1 research institute that's interested in partnering with this, that would be fantastic. Not that I'm a gopher, but I am. Uh, but that would that would be great. I mean, there's other mental health uh, organizations, and I saw that you had the the victims of uh, the center of torture. Uh, I, I'm not certain if there's a there's a testifier here or not, but uh, that that is that is an interesting institution as well. Thank you, thank you, Representative. And I know we have had conversations about um, so, uh, having support with Wilder as well um, and I think they helped organize the the pilot program as well as well as the university um, and I would specifically like to see that for spouses because there is not as much research um, regarding um, pre and post for spouses as there is for veterans and service members mr. chair can I just make closing closing comment um, uh, thank you very much. I'd like to be invited, or maybe as a veteran, go through this this process. I have not read as much as I've mm -hmm. I've seen today presented about this. Um, I do think uh, many of us have gone through a bunch of different types of tests, uh, po pre and post deployment. Um, this maybe has some hope for for some veterans. Um, so invite me to, to the next, uh, I'd like to see the operation and maybe even take part in it myself. And uh, Director Phillips, you've outed me. Um, I am married to a mental health therapist for over 31 years. So it's, uh, uh, so she, maybe she needs to take the EMDR uh, test as well. But uh, I, I've, um, as a guy that's an operator, uh, airborne ranger, done all that kind of stuff, um, about 12 years ago, uh, when I was the lead planner for the state, uh, the adjutant general came to me, and we'd just gotten back from uh, from Iraq, and we had uh, we lost three combat casualties, and then we also had uh, a suicide, a fair, fairly ranking member uh, that committed suicide in theater, and uh, we had this presence that that the Army was going to get serious now because they were taking a look at the metrics and this is active duty Army as well as Guard and Reserve Forces that uh, maybe we were uh, ahead of the, 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 the population on the amount of uh, suicides and why is that you know that's the big question you know how did we get here was it the war was it how we do things was it how we didn't do things uh, and he, he tasked me as a planner is to figure this thing out uh, it, it's because uh, we, we were listed as the highest reporting state for suicides. And there were other states that were much larger than us, and I'm not gonna name their names, but they were reporting zero suicides, where we knew that wasn't correct. So he sent me on this uh, uh, errand. Uh, it's uh, the quest for the grail, you know, what is it? And, uh, uh, you know, normally with uh, mental health kind of things, we'd send them off to the doc, or maybe it's a spiritual thing, we talk to the chaplain. Uh, in my conversations with how we dealt with it as an organization, uh, we shunted people off because, again, like operators, is uh, you break, you're not ours, we've got to keep on moving on, mission first, right? Well, then people always. So as we had a time to reflect, uh, and I was leading this group, uh, I brought in the, 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 the usual suspects and then started talking and realized that uh, it, it's, it's not complicated, it's a very complex problem. And it may be relationships, it may be deployment, it may be whatever. And when I went back to the adjutant general, uh, he said to me, uh, we may have not done this to them, but they're wearing the uniform, we have an obligation, and we're gonna, we're gonna do what we can for, for them. And we put together a program which was very invasive, uh, and it bordered on uh, HIPAA stuff, where we wanted to make certain that we were still protecting their privacy and their medical records, but we wanted to get at what was 
causing them problems. And who would know better uh, than their first line leader, the sergeants that uh, lead these guys? And maybe it was only for a weekend, a month after we got back from deployment. But the key thing is we were able to marshal the, the energy, hire a bunch of psychiatrists, and push people through using the, uh, the, the Beyond the Yellow Ribbon Network. And once we had launched the beta program, uh, I had lost two guys in my unit to suicide. Um, and we had, we had launched this thing and we got it going. Uh, the Minnesota National Guard had 13 months without a suicide. But we had a crap ton of suicide ideations. We had, our resources were maxed out. And we, ju we started finding out there's some cultural things. And once people were bought in to what, that mental health is something that we need to be aware of and we need to take you know, proactive actions and put the resources where the greatest need is, then we were able to start fighting it and combating it. Um, I don't know about EDMR, how effective it is, but I think it's worth a shot and I think uh, families, uh, they, they get a lot of, uh, lot, of, lot of feedback. And I mean, uh, and I use the word, uh, I say PTS, post-traumatic stress. Um, that's sort of a movement, you don't say disorder or syndrome, it's post-traumatic stress. All of us get it to, to a certain extent, whatever it is, car accident, and maybe some kind of altercation. But um, I just wanna say thank you for what you're doing but we're gonna hold you accountable. Absolutely. And we thank want you. this to work for our veterans and invite me. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chair. Thank you, Representative Wise. Thank you for sharing that. And, uh, <coughs> some of us try to fool ourselves and think we come out with post-traumatic strength. Uh, <laughs> and it's not exactly the case. Uh, Representative Greenman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and thank you, Representative Clardy, for, for bringing this bill. Um, I was on veterans, um, the Veterans Committee last uh, session when we heard this bill and I think last session we actually heard from a few um, veterans who were impacted um, and really found um, great relief in this uh, in this um, course of uh, e EMDR treatment I'm wondering just to ground us in because I think that 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 the conversation here is how we're actually providing that therapy and providing that uh, um, improvement for our veterans and their families. Um, if you could just ground us in, because I think that the, the statistic that you uh, mentioned, and maybe this is for Representative Clardy or Major Phillips, but um, with 77% of veterans completing um, uh, uh, the program and or the, the line of treatment and 100% and having um, um, some decrease in, in post-traumatic stress. Um, can you talk about sort of what that means for folks and their families um, who go through it and what that means in terms of that decrease in, in stress? Absolutely, I mean, there's so many examples as a therapist, but um, also what you mentioned, some of the veterans that came and gave their testimony. Um, one example we like to share is of um, Mr. Tom McKenna, and he, some of you might know him, he uh, runs a nonprofit called Every Third Saturday. Um, and at the time um, of him receiving EMDR, he had the suicidal ideation and significant PTSD. Um, but through EMDR, he was definitely able to um, be more desensitized, and now he runs nonprofit. Um, so I think um, a very successful nonprofit. Um, so that is one example. Um, and him and his um, spouse actually have, um, through that nonprofit, have um, ran marriage classes. Um, so I think that is just one example. Some recent examples, um, I had one veteran, um, we're actually working on her testimony right now. She is a survivor of military sexual trauma, uh, which is uh, basically a pandemic in, in and of itself in the military. Um, and she, um, her quote is, I want veterans to know when they heal themselves, they heal their families. And, uh, but I would also like to note that she received this treatment in 2014, I believe, and um, served from 79 to 81. Um, so I talk a lot about the disparity of time. And so that's 40 years of somebody's life versus 12 sessions. And that's what we're asking for all of you to support um, is um, really reducing the disparity of time. Um, I think the part of what that is too is a lot of education <coughs> and, and pacing with the veterans. Um, I'm a therapist, I'm a veteran, I, um, I'm married to a military member and let me tell you, it is a pacing. Um, it might not be today, it might not be tomorrow, but six months from now, that individual might be ready. I received a phone call um, just this past week of a veteran um, 
And I, I, I know it, it's a very hard phone call. Um, and so I also manage every veteran as a therapy program director. They're going <coughs> to me or getting set up with me directly. And then I work with their therapist um, to make sure there's quality of care. Um, Elaine Wynn, our founder, talks about one of the things we do a lot of the time is we ask veterans to share their stories before they're ready. And so we're even mindful of them sharing too much to me because I'm not going to be their therapist. Um, we need enough information to make sure they qualify, but then I really want them opening up with the correct person where it's going to be a safe and effective treatment. Um, so I hope I'm answering your question, but um, it's a it's a it's a significant privilege to hold space for these individuals. And I often think when they, they call us or come into a therapist store, it's actually the bravest thing they, they've done. Good, thank you. Are there any other questions? Yes, Representative Greenman, oh, please. Thank you, and I, I just really appreciate that. And I think hearing <coughs> Um, hearing the, the long-term impacts, I will say uh, that every that Tom Kenna and his every uh, um, third Saturday is um, in my district, <laughs> um, and so if you haven't had a chance to go um, visit, um, they have a coffee shop that that um, trains and um, um, veterans, and they have a whole new building. Um, but I think that what it part of uh, what I think is really important about this treatment and this this bill is all of that was made possible by that care and that therapy, right? It wasn't yeah. the only thing, but uh, um, really making sure that we're, we're focusing on the, the treatments that work for folks so that they can long-term and that giving back. I mean, if any of you want to come to um, to their new beautiful building and grab coffee with me, and, mm -hmm. um, um, and I'm sure Tom would love to have the whole committee. Um, but it's a really important thing because it is serving a whole new generation of, of veterans and their yeah. families. And so I just really appreciate that um, and appreciate the work you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Norris. Thank you, Chair Newton. Um, Major Phillips, I appreciate the, the fantastic work that, that you're doing and, and everyone associated with this organization is doing to help our vets. One thing that impressed me was the map included here in the slides of just kind of the statewide impact of, of your reach. And I'm wondering if you could elaborate a little bit further just on, you know, how do you reach out to, to connect with those vets, connect with um, their spouses? Director yeah, that's Phillips. a great um, question. Thank you, Representative. Um, we are hiring, um, right now we just hired one outreach coordinator and then we're hiring another one this summer, um, specifically in the North region. And so they will definitely be at any veteran event that you could possibly imagine. Um, we're also really building a relationship with the county veteran service officers. I'm actually speaking um, in, I think, I don't know, uh, maybe next week, um, so I should look at my calendar, um, to really make sure we partner with them. Um, sometimes veterans come in and they don't have the correct documentation. You'd be surprised on how many um, people struggle to find the correct DD-214. Um, so we really have been able to partner with that, and Commissioner Herkey is working on giving us a direct POC um, to help alleviate some of that as well. So we appreciate that support, um, but we, um, and honestly, this is the other thing that brought up spouses, like I would say about 50% um, is the spouses are contacting me to get their veterans set up for therapy, not the veteran themselves. And so um, the spouses are a, a critical asset, but you know, as they're emailing me or talking to me, um, I can hear it in their voices as well. So, um, but we're, we are also um, asking all of you to share and spread the word. Um, Minnesota is a really um, veteran-friendly state. Um, and actually, in the North region is probably the second highest concentration of veterans um, and in those rural communities. Um, so they are sometimes more difficult to reach, hence why we have um, the telehealth um, option as well, um, which is actually amazing. I was skeptical myself as a therapist doing EMDR therapy um, virtually. And I want it is the most amazing um, process to see um, people in their own homes and um, safe spaces move through it. Good, thank you. Are there any other questions? Anyone? Thank you. Uh, uh, Representative Clardy, I'll uh, renew the motion then that House File 1353 be laid over for possible inclusion. Um, Chair Newton? Yes, Representative Clardy. Um, I had one more person that was a testifier oh, that okay. made it here. Can you just make some brief comments? Yes, if she please come forward. Or Thank you. Please come forward, yeah. I'll make it quick. Okay. 
Please identify yourself for the record. Yes, hello. Uh, uh, my name is Jacob Thomas. Uh, I live in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Uh, for the record, there. Um, thank you for letting me testify briefly. Um, so I live downtown uh, in Minneapolis. I served the United States Air Force from 2008 to 2016. Um, and I'm also the communication director for Common Defense, which is a national uh, veterans organization that helps train and organize veterans across the country uh, to create a more just, peaceful, and equitable world. Um, and I wanted to come in support of HF 1353 as well. Um, a brief kind of just statistics, since I feel like we all love those, uh, it sounds like. <laughs> um, so some research done by the White House uh, that was recently put out um, says since 2010, uh, more than 71,000 veterans have died uh, by suicide, which is the total number, which is more than the total number of deaths uh, in combat during Vietnam um, and Iraq and Afghanistan combined. Um, an important aspect of that uh, is that post 9 11 veterans like myself uh, represent an overage in that grouping um, of both people diagnosed with PTSD and with suicidal ideation. Um, so, with those numbers, um, and then post 9 11 for the record as well, right, is uh, those who served after the attacks in 2001 uh, in <clears throat> both wars in Iraq, Afghanistan, and then the more commonly grouped global war on terror, uh, which is still part of the original AUMFs there. Um, so about 7% of veterans overall throughout eras uh, are diagnosed with PTSD and then um, subsequently have other issues tied to that. Uh, for post 11 veterans, that's about 29% of their subset uh, for the era that they served in. Uh, that are diagnosed. We also, as I think we kind of talked about earlier as well, um, women veterans uh, hold much higher rates of PTSD as well. Um, so about 13% uh, of women veterans have PTSD um, or PTS symptoms. Um, it's about 6% overall for males uh, in the military. Um, and we know, as we've talked about earlier as well, that um, secondary traumatic stress or secondary PTSD uh, is a real thing and comes with its own issues and effects. Um, and that is mainly handled and carried by military spouses, family members, and caregivers. Uh, one of my roles while I was on active duty and then later in the reserves uh, here, actually, um, was as a sexual assault victim's advocate. Um, in that role, uh, we worked with survivors of military sexual trauma and their families to help get the care that they needed and navigate the courts martial process or civilian court process, uh, depending on which way things needed to go. Um, and I, through that process, actually first learned about EMDR myself in 2013 from Air Force medical officers uh, who were testing it out in that space. And I saw how effective it can be, not only for our veterans, but for anyone experiencing PTSD. Um, so I've seen it be effective. I've seen it help both our service members, um, their families, their spouses, uh, and caregivers. Uh, and as a veteran myself living with PTSD and a survivor of military sexual trauma, uh, I think it's very, very important that we continue to help support Minnesota veterans here uh, in that work. So I would urge support uh, of the committee on, on this bill as well. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Any closing <laughs> remarks, Representative Clary? Yes, uh, thank you, Chair Newton. Um, just like last week, I think that this is, um, you saw a lot of bills last week and you kept saying that this is a fix or this is something that, you know, was missed last time. So um, I appreciate the discussion that we've had and um, fix might not be the right word, but this is so family oriented. Um, like one of um, them said, you know, it's like if you work with one person, it can help heal the whole family. And yes, I am a freshman, I'm 65, and guess what? <laughs> I'm learning a lot from a lot of people that are younger, but also I've had experience in this. And, and so therefore, being a freshman, it's important to bring new ideas to committees. So I think that needs to be looked at. And just like you said, um, Representative um, Weens, it is important for us not to forget the survivors, because that's what you had said on another case. So or not the survivors, but the other part of the family. 
so I think data is really important and I think that um, this program is really good and it's not a one size fit all, but guess what? It fits a lot of people and it will make a lot of healthy families. So I'm encouraging you to, you to vote yes on this. Okay. Thank you, Representative Clardy. So I renew my motion to uh, uh, move House File 1353B laid over for possible inclusion. And I, you know, I, I just want to follow up on what Representative Clardy is saying is that all of the bills today actually have to do with families. And I think we as veterans uh, recognize the importance of families and the roles that they play in supporting those of us that, that serve, that they, they do serve themselves. Um, we are uh, probably going to wrap up our, our um, sessions on, the, I think, about the 7th of, uh, of March, something like that. So if any of you have any bills or anything that you would like to have brought forward just for, um, you know, for us to look at, um, please don't hesitate to contact me or, or Adam and uh, be happy to, to hear whatever you might have or any of the colleagues that have veterans issues. Representative Lissigar. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, before we leave, I'd just like to give a shout out to the 148th. I don't oh, know yeah. if, uh, <laughs> I don't know if every, anyone saw that, but um, that was a pretty big deal, right? Yeah. Um, and so, uh, you know, uh, anybody wants to sign on my bill for that hanger, it's 25 million bucks. <laughs> I would greatly appreciate it, but it does go show that, so, you know, um, it's important. You know, whole M security, it's right here. So um, shout out to them. Yeah, yeah good. Yeah, yeah thank you. That's, that's <laughs> good. <and> little green <laughs> <laughs> Not just balloons. They were in the balloon, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, the uh, committee is adjourned. Thank you all. Okay.